So today is my greatest pleasure to introduce my, our speaker, Colin Fogarty from MIT and from uh, Sloan, uh, Sloan School of Management at, at MIT. And Colin got his PhD in Wharton, working with Dylan Small, and he has been working on a lot of ex exciting topics in causal inference and in the design of experiment. And today he's going to talk about unifying modes of inference for randomized experiments. And let's welcome Colin. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Yanchi. Thank you all for the invitation. Thanks for having me. And yeah, my, my talk today is on unifying modes of inference for randomized experiments. So I thought I would begin today's talk by taking a little step back in time to the early 1930s when uh, Naaman and Fisher were embroiled in a fairly acrimonious debate over what notion of no treatment effects should be preferred for inference. Now, in Fisher's mind, when we say that a treatment has no effect, well, that should mean that the treatment has no effect for any individual in the study. And uh, this strong notion of no treatment effect has come to be known as Fisher's sharp null hypothesis. Now, we can contrast that with uh, what Naaman's view was. In, in Naaman's mind, when we think about testing for a treatment effect, well, maybe we should allow for idiosyncrasies on the individual level, some individuals positive treatment effects, some negative but that the average of the treatment effect should equal zero when we talk about a treatment effect having a treatment rather having no effect. This weaker notion has come to be known as Naaman's weak null hypothesis. Now, clearly, the truth of the sharp null implies the truth of Naaman's weak null. But more importantly, these two different operational definitions give rise to very different modes of inference. So under Fisher's notion, kind of, you can use the physical act of randomization alone as a reason basis for inference. And doing so, you get to hypothesis tests that look a lot like permutation tests. Under Naaman's weaker notion of no effect, you're instead led to, you know, tests that look a lot like the usual large sample tests based on asymptotic normality. So uh, clearly, you know, the definitions are different. The modes of inference are different. The, our main focus today will be on whether or not the distinction between these has uh, practical implications. So, you know, Naaman certainly thought so. In, in a paper presented to the Royal Statistical Society in 1935, he suggested that for Latin squares designs and other experimental designs, that if a practitioner used Fisher's tools for inference that are valid, even in finite samples for Fisher's sharp null of no effect, they might be anti-conservative when only there's no effect on average. So when Naaman's null holds, but maybe Fisher's null does not. And so this elicited an acerbic response from uh, Fisher. So this, this response is published in that article in JRSSB. And it says, uh, Professor Fisher, in opening the discussion, said he had hoped that Naaman's paper would be on a subject with which the author was fully acquainted and on which he could speak with authority. But since seeing the paper, he had come to the conclusion that Naaman had been somewhat unwise in his choice of topics. So contentious issue then continues to be a contentious issue to this day. I'll say if you want a nice summary of arguments, maybe for Naaman's null, Andrew Gelman has a really nice blog post about this. For arguments for Fisher's null hypothesis, any of the textbooks or writings of, of Paul Rosenbaum would be a, a wonderful place to start for an articulate defense of that stronger notion. But our, our main focus will, again, be more on the practical implications, kind of what Naaman was concerned about in that paper he presented. So we'll be considering the finite uh, population model for causal inference. And so let's suppose under that model, uh, I'll talk more about what that means in a few slides, but suppose that the practitioner actually has in mind the null, that the average of the treatment effects for the individuals in the experiment equals zero, but that ends up testing this using a Fisher randomization test, which will look a lot like permutation tests. So he really wants to be testing the null of no effect on average, but does this using a permutation test. Now, I'd say a seemingly innocuous choice of the test statistic for testing whether or not there's no effect on average might be to look at a permutation test based on the difference in sample means. So enumerate the permutation distribution, looking at the difference in treated means and control means. Now, unfortunately, as we'll talk more about, that doesn't need even provide a test, valid test for this weak null of no effect on average, even asymptotically. So I'd say for those of you less familiar with uh, causal inference, a similar issue arises in the context of the usual test for equality and distribution. So suppose I'm in the more standard statistical setting where I've got one sample IID from population zero, another sample IID from population one, these two samples independent of one another. 
And I'd like to test the null of equality and distributions between population zero and population one. And my desire is to have type one error control at any sample size. So I'd like an exact test. Of course, what we know is that the only exact tests for this problem are permutation tests. So forget about the labels, forget who was labeled zero, who's labeled one, randomly assign these individuals to labels of zero and one, and figure out the permutation distribution for any chosen test statistic. Now, while certainly exactness is nice, the tests is, are elegant, uh, to many equality and distributions may seem like an overly restrictive null. Like it'll tell me that the distributions are different, but, you know, to what extent does this actually point to the reason that the distributions are different? Can it tell me something like that the means are different of the distributions? The variances of the distributions are different. And it, it turns out not necessarily, even for seemingly benign choices of test statistics. So, for example, the permutation test where I'm permuting the difference in means, say, between sample zero and sample one, does not give me a valid test, even asymptotically, for the null of equality of first moments between the distributions. Similarly, the permutation distribution for the ratio of the sample variances wouldn't result in a valid test, even asymptotically, for the null of equality of variances between the two populations. So uh, in the context of causal inference, a recent literature is kind of focused on developing randomization tests that are simultaneously exact under the sharp null hypothesis of no effect at all, but that also maintain asymptotic conservativeness under Neyman's weak null of no effect on average. That is to say, to try to provide a test that simultaneously provides exactness under the sharp null, but still, if a practitioner erroneously looks at that test and thinks that it's actually a test for the null of no effect on average, that at least asymptotically they'll be correct, that that'll be, con that'll be conservative inference. And I'll just note that this conservative inference is going to be a property of the finite population model that I'll be proceeding under, rather than any deficiency in the test that I'll be uh, introducing. So if one proceeded under a superpopulation model, this conservativeness would go away. Uh, so, you know, the sharp null and the weak null, they're certainly different, but these kind of tests obviate the distinction for practitioners. They introduce a sort of robustness to natural misinterpretations to the conclusions to which a practitioner might be entitled. Um, so I'll say, you know, to, to date, most of these papers have really provided resolutions on a case-by-case -case basis. That is to say, consider a particular experimental design and then under that particular experimental design, try to develop a test statistic for a, for a Fisher randomization test that retains validity under the weak null of no effect on average. So what we're going to do today is try to take a step back and provide a general methodology for providing this resolution. Uh, it turns out that the you know, general methodology is going to precisely recover all of the known corrections in the literature for providing randomization tests that maintain validity under the weak null hypothesis, but also provide new unifications in situations where existing fixes fall short, where say, you know, either for a given experiment des design people hadn't figured it out, or for a particular test statistic, nobody had known how to fix the test statistic. So before diving in, I just want to point to some references for the talk. Most of it will be derived from this first paper that just appeared in JRSSB, but there are other, also a few follow-up papers that are in various stages of completion that I'll be pulling from today. So, uh, you know, the big hammer that we'll be introducing is pre-pivoting in the context of randomization tests. So I'll introduce, you know, some notation, give a little bit of review, and after that, try to dive into the difference between the true distribution of a test statistic versus the behavior of a reference distribution when one erroneously assumes that the treatment effects equal zero for all individuals, when one erroneously assumes that the sharp null hypothesis holds. After doing that, I'll introduce you know, some general test statistics that are commonly deployed for testing weak null hypotheses, and then talk about deficiencies of uh, randomization tests when using these test statistics, when enumerating their reference distributions, erroneously assuming that the treatment effects equal zero for all individuals. We'll then introduce the big resolution, Gaussian pre-pivoting, and show some simulations highlighting the benefits of this correction.
So, you know, for some general notation, we're gonna say there are N total individuals, N one of whom received the treatment and N zero of whom received the control. So we'll, uh, my treatment indicators will be Zs. So Zi will equal one if treated and zero otherwise. I'll have my YIZ, uh, YI1 and YI0 will be my D-dimensional potential outcomes under treatment and control. YI1 then is what would have happened had I assigned the individual the treatment. YI0, what would have happened had I assigned the individual the control. This tau i is going to be the unobservable treatment effect uh, for each individual. So again, the fundamental problem of causal inference is that I never get to see yi1 and yi0 simultaneously for any individual, so I don't know these individual treatment effects. Tau bar is going to be an estimate of interest for us that is going to be the sample average treatment effect for the individuals in the experimental population under consideration. So for those N individuals who have been recruited into our experiment. I'll additionally be considering certain regression adjusted estimators. And with that in mind, I'm going to have, uh, you know, XI are gonna be my uh, vector of pretreatment covariates for each individual. Importantly, these are variables that whose uh, values are not affected by the treatment assigned to an individual. So in the finite population model, we're going to consider inference conditional upon the set script F. So conditional upon the features of the individuals that have been enrolled in this particular experiment. The probabilistic statements in what follows are going to then arise from solely from randomization, the randomness in the treatment assignment in the experimental design. Now, I know some people don't like proceeding under this framework, so I'll just mention that the results that I present extend naturally to superpopulation uh, formulations. So there's a natural kind of harmony, a consonance between the methods in, super in the finite population model and what the results might look like if I instead imagined a generative model for either the potential outcomes, the covariates, or both. So I'm just going to consider for simplicity, completely randomized experiments. Most of these results extend to other experimental designs, but I'm going to let the omega be the set of allowed randomizations in a completely randomized design. So that's going to be the set of randomizations where exactly N1 individuals receive the treatment and the other N0 receive the control. Then in a completely randomized design, the probability of any one treatment assignment is then just uniform over the set of allowed treatment assignments. Now, what we observe, well, I get to observe these YIZIs, which is just going to be, if I receive the treatment, I observe the potential outcome under treatment, otherwise the potential outcome under control. I'll let Y of Z be my N by D matrix of observed responses. And tau hat is going to be my notation for our treatment effect estimator. Um, I show explicitly the dependence on Y of Z, the outcomes, and also Z, the treatment assignment vector. I'll just note it could also depend on X, like if I'm doing a regression adjusted estimator, but just for ease of notation, I'm going to suppress this and what follows. So with notation established, I now want to kind of dive in and thinking about the true distribution of a test statistic and contrast that with the reference distribution that one would generate if one proceeded under the assumption that the sharp null of no effect at all actually held. So I'll let T of Y, Z, and Z be a scalar test statistic. It can depend on the observed responses, uh, the observed treatment assignment, and potentially the covariates if we so choose. Then the true distribution under the finite population model for a test statistic T would just be simply enumerating for each possible treatment assignment if I knew what the observed outcomes would be under treatment, any treatment vector W in omega, I would then figure out what those outcomes would be. I know what the assignment would be, this W, and then I would just compute what that test statistics value takes on for that treatment assignment. Uh, while that's wonderful to write down, uh, unfortunately, it's generally unknown. The reason being that it, this randomization distribution, depends upon the missing potential outcomes. So I only get to observe Y of capital Z, that is the observed outcomes. Whereas this enumeration would require in certain Ws, I would need to know that unobserved potential outcomes. So I don't generally have access to that randomization distribution. Here's kind of some of the motivation for proceeding under the sharp null of no effect at all. So if I proceed under this notion of no effect at all, 
then under the null hypothesis, what I then know is the observed outcome equals the potential outcome under treatment equals the potential outcome under control. So while you know, generally I don't know the randomization distribution, under this null hypothesis, if I write down this reference distribution, say PT of T, that and what I'm doing there is still summing over W in omega, but I'm keeping Y of Z fixed. So I'm just varying the W here in this summation, but I'm computing what the test statistic would look like if Y of Z was the observed set of outcomes under treatment assignment W. Under the null hypothesis, that is exactly correct. So for that reason, this ends up aligning under the sharp null of no effect with the true randomization distribution. And it's for this reason that I can use this reference distribution to provide an exact test for the null effect of no, uh, the null hypothesis of no effect at all at any sample size. Now, to get into where some sort of misinterpretations, asymptotic incorrectness might arise, suppose instead that only the weak null of no effect on average holds but that a researcher nonetheless maybe has said, oh, I can get an exact test by using a Fisher randomization test and wants to do that. So they really only want to test the weak null, but erroneously they proceed using this reference distribution to which they're only entitled under the sharp null. And of course, what we see is that I could, of course, enumerate that reference distribution, okay? It would look like this, but that is not going to align with the true randomization distribution for the test statistic if only the weak null holds. So in fact, you know, this PT is going to be a random measure in general under the weak null. If I observed a tre different treatment assignment Z, I would get a different matrix Y of Z. Hence, this whole reference distribution would change from one randomization to the next. So it doesn't align with the true randomization distribution. And uh, in fact, that disconnect can result in these randomization tests being invalid for the weak null, even asymptotically. And that's why, you know, it's kind of very similar logic that gives rise to, uh, in general, a permutation distribution does not provide asymptotically valid inference for functionals of those distributions, unless I'm careful. So, and what I'll now do is try to establish a sort of desiderata, something I would want to hold in order for me to have a robust randomization test. That is, a, I could use the Fisher randomization distribution for a test statistic, and I would still be entitled to asymptotically valid inference if only the weak null hypothesis holds. So let's suppose that like the randomization distribution converges weakly to some limit, and that that reference distribution, assuming that the sharp null holds, converges weakly in probability to some limiting measure PT infinity. And so I just need weak convergence and probability because PT is itself a random measure in general. So I'm going to introduce this notion that I'll call asymptotic sharp dominance. And I'll say a test statistic is asymptotically sharp dominant if basically the reference distribution, erroneously assuming that the sharp null holds, stochastically dominates the true randomization distribution. That is that the right tail probabilities for the reference distribution are larger than those from the randomization distribution. So what this would mean is that in the limit, if this relation held, then the limiting upper tail probabilities of the true randomization distribution could be upper bounded by those of the reference distribution. And that would provide asymptotic conservativeness when using a reference distribution that assumes that the sharp null holds. That is, even if only the weak null held of no effect on average, if I use the reference distribution that is truly only valid if the sharp null holds, I would still get asymptotically valid inference. So what I'll now do is try to introduce certain common forms of test statistics that are encountered for testing the weak null hypothesis. I'm going to introduce various regularity conditions, things of this sort, and then talk about how, you know, for this general class, generally, the reference distributions assuming the sharp null don't immediately provide asymptotic sharp dominance. So I'll say that most t test statistics for testing the weak null could be expressed in the following form, where the test statistic can look like it's a function of say root n times my estimator of tau hat, and this function can depend upon a nuisance parameter. And I'll say that f eta as a function satisfies the following conditions that it is continuous 
quasi-convex and non-negative, mirror symmetric about the origin. And for those not familiar, quasi-convex just means that it has uh, the function as convex level sets. I will end up needing that at some point due to some fundamental limitations in variance estimation under the finite population model. Um, it will allow me to apply a result called Anderson's theorem on uh, that, that allows for Gaussian comparison uh, for different Gaussians with uh, certain relations between their covariances. Um, sorry. So what I'll now do to try to, you know, give more insight into what can go wrong is to focus on the limiting behavior of say root n tau hat, uh, just root n times my treatment effect estimators under both the true randomization distribution and the potentially erroneous assumption that the sharp null holds. Try to think about, how, you know, as you can imagine, it's going to be asymptotically Gaussian. We'll try to compare those Gaussian measures and then realize that, okay, the behavior of any test statistic will just be based upon a push forward of those measures. All right, so in terms of the treatment effect estimators under consideration, I'm going to consider asymptotically linear treatment effect estimators. So this first line will be a little more familiar. This is going to be about the kind of asymptotically linear representation under the true randomization distribution for the test statistic. And that's just to say that if I do some, what I'll do is I'll take the observed responses, subtract off the average treatment effect for the individuals who receive the treatment, and then compute this estimator along with the actually observed treatment assignment that I've got that this looks like a difference in means for some constants epsilon i uh, one and epsilon i zero, okay? Furthermore, what I'm going to assume is that if I look at this expression, I'm again, initially taking the observed outcomes, subtracting off the average of the treatment effects for the individuals who receive the treatment, but instead of computing this treatment effect estimator with Z, the observed treatment assignment, I am instead going to take a new draw independent from Z from the set of omega, so from the set of allowable treatment assignments, and then look at the behavior of tau hat with YZ minus Z tau bar and that new randomly drawn assignment W that was independent from the Z that gave rise to that observation. Now, it turns out that the reason for doing this is the behavior of this test statistic ends up very much informing what the behavior of the reference distribution is. It's as though I'm treating this as fixed and then just drawing new, new, new Ws and allowing the only variation to be in W. That ends up being the reason, the motivation for this. But in any event, I'm going to assume that this is also has an asymptotically linear representation with potentially different values for these constants. So epsilon tilde one, epsilon tilde zero. Um, I'll say this doesn't really limit the types of treatment effect estimators used in practice. You know, you can use the difference in means satisfies this form. Most say Oaxaca blinder or regression adjusted estimators can also satisfy this form depending upon the type of regression adjustment being deployed. Okay. So I'll just assume a few regularity conditions, just that like the fraction of individuals receiving the treatment converges us to some limiting value, that these covariances and averages are converging to you know, limiting values as well. And I'll also just for simplicity, assume bounded fourth moments. I don't think this is the you know, weakest possible regularity conditions. You can probably get away with two plus delta moments. But my, my focus wasn't in particular on the weakest regularity conditions, but more on providing this resolution. Um, so in a completely randomized design under these assumptions, then what you can end up showing is that root n tau hat minus tau bar will, you know, be asymptotically Gaussian. And it will be asymptotically Gaussian with a covariance V. Now, in general, this covariance V cannot be consistently estimated. So this covariance V is going to have three components. The first two are going to look kind of similar for the usual covariance of the difference in means in a superpopulation model. This third term kind of arises in the finite population model. And what we end up seeing is that this third term ends up depending on it being the covariance for the differences in these constants, epsilon i1 and epsilon i0. And those end up, you know, kind of being pseudo potential outcomes. So I don't, I am not actually able to come up with a consistent estimate for sigma delta infinity in general. 
Uh, this, uh, yeah, so it depends on this sigma delta infinity. And in general, I'm not going to be able to consistently estimate this. And I'll, I'll give an example of a certain estimator to give some insight into why that's the case. Now, that said, many covariance estimators exist of the following form, that in a sense, they are conservative in the loner order. That is to say that V hat, uh, the covariance estimator, minus the true covariance converge in probability to some positive semi-definite matrix lambda that takes on the form lambda equals zero so that I get consistency rather than conservativeness if this sigma delta infinity equals zero. So to you know, just give an example, so this isn't so far-fetched, that when tau hat is the treated minus control difference in means, the conventional covariance estimator in a two-sample problem satisfies v hat minus v converges in probability to sigma tau infinity, where sigma tau would be the covariance of the treatment effects. And again, I don't have access to the individual level treatment effects, which you know it results in me being unable to estimate this consistently in the finite population model. So that gives me a sense of what the true behavior of the test statistic is. We'll now try to contrast that with the limiting behavior of the reference distribution when I erroneously assume that the sharp null hypothesis holds. So when assuming the sharp null, this is what the reference distribution looks like. Again, I'm assuming that y of z is going to be the outcome regardless of the treatment assignment observed. And then I just enumerate this over all possible treatment assignments. This is the you know, reference distribution I would be entitled to if the sharp null of no effect at all helped. Now, I can also equivalently write this as this conditional probability that when z and w are independent uniform draws over omega, this is just going to be the probability that t of y, z, and w less than or equal to t conditional upon the observed treatment z. So then it's natural to understand the reference distribution's limiting behavior. I can consider this conditional distribution. Think about what my treatment effect estimators centered by the average treatment effect and combined with a random draw W from the set omega that is independent from C, how do the treatment effect estimators behave there? That's going to give me a sense of how is the difference in means behaving in the reference distribution? Then of course, any, you know, any uh, test statistic I consider will just be a push forward based upon that. So it turns out that you know, under these conditions, I've established that the conditional distribution here uh, converges weakly in probability to a mean zero a Gaussian, again with mean zero, but with covariance of the following form. Now, importantly, I'll compare this, the covariance governing the reference distribution, to the actual covariance governing the randomization distribution. We see a few things have happened. We've got one minus p versus p, p versus one minus p, but also this is governed by epsilon tilde rather than epsilon. So in general, V tilde, this covariance governing the reference distribution is not going to line with V, the true covariance governing the randomization distribution. So for that reason, I can potentially get anti-conservative inference. Of course, the exception is that if the sharp null hypothesis held, then these two would exactly equal one another. So it turns out that, you know, for these reasons, test statistics of this general form, and this form includes things like absolute values of the difference in means, norms, max of absolute T statistics, things of this form. These don't need to satisfy asymptotic sharp dominance when the weak null holds, but the sharp null does not. So as an example, suppose that the outcomes are scalar, consider root N absolute tau hat in a completely randomized design. So it turns out the, you know, the true distribution for root n absolute tau hat would tend to a half normal with a dispersion parameter v. The reference distribution would tend to a half normal with a different dispersion parameter v tilde. And so it can actually occur, you know, depending on how the potential outcome allocations look, that v, that true uh, dispersion parameter, exceeds the dispersion parameter governing the randomization uh, the reference distribution. And if that's the case, the reference distribution tails aren't going to be fat enough. So you can potentially get anti-conservative inference even in the limit if this relation holds.
So then a natural question then is what can be done to establish sharp dominance? What kind of transformation of a test statistic like this can end up getting me a reference distribution that is exact under the sharp null, but maintains asymptotic validity for the null of testing no effect on average? And that's going to be with this, where this transformation Gaussian pre-pivoting plays a role. It's going to be this transformation of a test statistic that looks of that form to try to get me back to a regime where I've got exact and asymptotically conservative inference. So pre-pivoting in general is going to introduce by Rudy Barron in a sequence of uh, papers in the late 80s. It's just the act of transforming a test statistic by an estimator of its distribution function. I'll say if you haven't read these papers, I strongly recommend it. Just, uh, just wonderful papers. So he was considering uh, pre-pivoting in a very different context. So he was uh, considering pre-pivoting based upon a test statistics bootstrap CDF with the objective of obtaining higher order corrections to the level of tests and confidence intervals through bootstrap iteration. So, so through iteratively successively applying estimates of a bootstrap CDF of a test statistic. You can, if you iterate on that process, you can get higher order corrections for tests and for confidence intervals. So here we're going to show just the utility of this idea of transformation by the estimator of a CDF to restore first order correctness for tests of weak null under the finite population model. And you know, I might allude to time permitting to see how this pre-pivoting could be used to assure validity of inference under common superpopulation models. So I'm gonna now just kind of give a loose statement of the proposal to try to give some insight into what we're doing before diving in and showing the actual transformation. So rather than considering as input, as the test statistic whose permutation distribution will be enumerated, a test statistic itself, let me take instead as input a candidate p-value using a test statistic that is known to provide asymptotically conservative inference under the weak null and consistent in level inference under the sharp null hypothesis. And it turns out this is not a strong requirement at all. I mean, generally, any of those test statistics that I'm describing are commonly used for inference for the weak null hypothesis. Therefore, a p-value that is asymptotically valid already exists, there already exists a, a large sample test that is based upon these test statistics. So that asymptotically conservative inference that is easy to hold. And furthermore, generally these tests have the property that if treatment effects are constant, the inference is consistent in level rather than conservative. So what I'm then going to do is to construct the randomization distribution using one minus the asymptotically valid p-value as a test statistic rather than using the test statistic itself. So in other words, rather than enumerating the distribution of the test statistic, I will take that asymptotically valid large sample p-value and enumerate its permutation distribution. So enumerating in a sense the permutation distribution of one minus a large sample p-value for a test statistic. So that's exactly what I'm saying here, that ultimately that is what we're going to use to proceed with inference. Look at the reference distribution of one minus an asymptotically valid p-value, where I'm talking about asymptotic validity in terms of testing the weak null hypothesis. So then typically, if I had an asymptotically valid p-value, I would just compare that p-value to alpha to determine rejection. Instead, what we're going to do is to compare one minus that p-value to the one minus alpha quantile of the reference distribution where we, potentially erroneously assume that the sharp null hypothesis holds. And we'll then kind of state formally that this ends up resolving the issue. It ends up giving me a single test that is exact under the sharp null, but asymptotically correct under the weak null hypothesis. So, you know, just to introduce a, a few more conditions we'll need before diving into the transformation. So again, we're gonna take as input a test statistic of this form and we're just going to assume certain things that in terms of these nuisance parameters, like for example, the nuisance parameter could be a variance estimator involved in a, in a, a test statistic that when thinking about its behavior under the true randomization distribution, it converges in probability to some value uh, psi. And that if I think about the limiting behavior of that nuisance parameter under the reference distribution, it also converges in probability 
to a potentially different value, psi tilde. So these don't need to align, just the convergence and probability needs to happen. And I'll also assume that I have access to one of these variance estimators that I previously described, where that basically when I think about behavior for the true randomization distribution, it provides a conservative covariance estimator. But when thinking about how that covariance estimator behaves under the reference distribution, assuming the sharp null hypothesis, it ends up uh, converging in probability to V tilde. And remember, V tilde was the covariance that governs the behavior of that reference distribution. Okay, so what we'll now do to consider is a transformation. Again, we're gonna take as input that test statistic and try to think about a transformation of the test statistic that restores asymptotic validity under the weak null. So the transformation will look as follows. That basically what I'm doing is imagining that I've got a multivariate normal with mean zero and covariance v hat, and I'm just going to compute the left tail probability associated with that multivariate normal evaluated at the observed value of the test statistic. So that's all I'm thinking about here. If I've got a multivariate normal, mean zero, covariance v hat, think about what is the probability that a multivariate normal following that distribution, if I take a transformation f psi hat of that multivariate normal, falls less than or equal to the observed value of the test statistic. So yeah, really, this is just a push forward measure of the asymptotic approximation. So I just like kind of pretend that psi hat and v hat are fixed. And then this G, Y, Z of Z, this transformation, is this F psi hat push forward measure. Um, another way to just think about it is precisely as I described beforehand. You realize this is exactly one minus the P value of a large sample test for Neyman's null using F psi hat root n tau hat as the test statistic. So rather than proceeding using this as my test statistic, I then take that p-value, and I'll consider that p-value in what follows. So yeah, that is rather than directly you know, using that p-value to perform inference to reject the weak null, I instead deploy the following reference distribution, where what I'm doing here is basically calculating what 1 minus the p-value would have been if I imagine that y of z is fixed, as I would under the sharp null hypothesis, and think about what the various values that one minus that p-value would take on for different treatment assignments w within the set omega. And of course, it's still going to be the case that the true randomization distribution does not align with the reference distribution. But nonetheless, suppose that I go ahead and say that I wanna test the weak null hypothesis, and I'm going to do it using this reference distribution. So I could just compare the observed value of the test statistic to the critical value. So this, this theorem basically says that this kind of transformation restores asymptotic validity. So there are two components here, one considering what happens under the true randomization distribution, the other what happens under the reference distribution. So this first statement says that the true randomization distribution of the test statistic converges in distribution to a random variable u tilde that um, you know, that, that has this relation with respect to the uniform that is stochastically dominated by a uniform. On the other hand, the true, uh, the, the behavior of the reference distribution behaves as follows. The reference distribution actually converges weakly in probability to a uniform. So the randomization distribution is stochastically dominated by a uniform whereas the reference distribution converges weakly in probability to a uniform. So the limiting in the limit, the upper tail probabilities of the reference distribution are going to bound those of the randomization distribution. So that ends up get, getting me kind of providing this desiderata, the thing that I was trying to accomplish. Under the sharp null hypothesis, for any n, this provides an exact test, of course, because it's a Fisher randomization test. Under the weak null hypothesis, though, I still get asymptotic validity. So this conservative inference, again, is kind of a fundamental property under the finite population model. But again, basically what this is saying is that if a practitioner takes a, it takes a Fisher randomization test, takes a permutation test, 
but really has in mind the null of no effect on average, after this transformation, the reference distribution will still provide asymptotically valid inference for the null of no effect on average. So to give some insight into you know, why we might proceed with this relative to either a large sample test or relative to a certain permutation test that has not undergone pre-pivoting, what we'll do is consider a particular treatment effect estimator and see how things unfold. So Lynn, 2013, considered a regression adjusted estimators for the average treatment effect. So basically what this paper proposes is using the coefficient on Z, so Z is my treatment effect indicator, in a regression of the outcomes on the treatment uh, assignment, the centered covariates, and treatment by covariate interactions as an estimator. And to use heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors uh, to perform inference with a normal approximation. So it turns out that you know, that estimator is root inconsistent, and it, uh, the benefit of it is that the true variance there is never worse than that of the difference in means, even under model misspecification. So it's this like agnostic regression adjustment. Even if I don't assume a linear model, I can do better by regression adjusting with a linear model than had I done no regression adjustment at all. And furthermore, it's known that this HC consistent standard error is conservative for the true variance. Um, so in, in this simulation, so in each iteration, I'm going to generate a finite population. I'll then form what the observed outcomes would be. And I'm going to have an imbalanced design where say 20% of individuals receive the treatment and 80% receive the control. And in each iteration, I'm going to try to test the null that the sample average effect equals zero using regression adjustment. So I'll have two generative models. Uh, don't worry too much about the form, but just in one of them, there will be constant effects. So the sharp null will hold. So there, any permutation test would, pry, would provide valid inference. But uh, there will be a second formulation where effects are heterogeneous, but average to zero. Uh, so basically, if tau hat is that uh, regression adjusted effect estimator, I'm going to consider three candidate tests, uh, see how they behave under these generative models. The first, that large sample test provided by Lynn uh, based on asymptotic normality. The second would be a Fisher randomization test, just using that, that uh, regression adjusted estimator. So think about that as just basically enumerating the permutation distribution of the regression adjusted estimator itself without any transformation. And third, the Fisher randomization test using Gaussian pre-pivoting, using the transformation that I've introduced in this talk. So, you know, basically that applies pre-pivoting to the test statistic deployed here. So that would be taking this test statistic as input and then applying pre-pivoting using these HC standard errors. It turns out that the result is that I'm enumerating the reference distribution of one minus the p-value that this test is deploying. So by Gaussian pre-pivoting this test statistic, the new test statistic whose reference distribution is enumerated is one minus the p-value used by this large sample test. So here are some results, and I'll start with what happens under the sharp null, and then think about what happens under the weak null. So you know, the first in these first two simulations, the sharp null hypothesis holds. And so a benefit of using a, uh, a uh, Fisher randomization test or a permutation test in a context like this is that even in a situation where n equals 50, if the sharp null holds, I know that the randomization test will provide me an exact test. And so here, the desired type 1 error rate is alpha equals 0.1. And I see that up to Monte Carlo error, I'm exactly accomplishing that, even at n equals 50. Whereas the large sample test, uh, that uh, Lynn provided in his paper. Again, that's valid for the weak null, but it's not exact for the sharp null. We end up seeing that it ends up being anti-conservative in small samples. Of course, by n equals 1,000, you know, things start to settle down. The limiting distribution is a much better approximation. Those issues go away. We'll now try to think about what happens under the weak null hypothesis. So this is a situation we were concerned with in the talk where let's say a practitioner wants to test the weak null, but has heard all these wonderful things about permutation tests. They provide exact tests. So maybe I proceed doing inference using one of those. 
And so what we see for the weak null hypothesis is that you know by n equals 1,000, the large sample test is providing conservative inference. Again, that conservativeness is just a property of the finite population model. But we then look to see what happened with the randomization test, to which the practitioner is not entitled, because in this generative model, only the weak null holds, but the sharp null does not. This is the uh, kind of the permutation test that only permutes the treatment effect estimator without any transformation. And what we end up seeing here is that even at n equals 1,000, and even beyond that, even asymptotically, the Fisher randomization test that permutes the, this treatment effect estimator itself is anti-conservative when only the weak null hypothesis holds. So this was the issue we were worried about. Maybe a practitioner would use this test and say that they were entitled to inference on no effect on average. What we see over here is that by pre-pivoting, this is the pre-pivoted transformation that we've introduced, we get back to having asymptotic conservativeness at n equals 1,000 and also have better behavior at n equals 50 for testing this null hypothesis. So in thinking about this procedure, we can see the benefits of it. It is a randomization test so that when the sharp null hypothesis holds, I've got an exact test at any sample size. But if only the weak null hypothesis holds, I get asymptotically valid inference, which is not accomplished in general for permutation tests. You have to be careful about the particular test statistic whose permutation distribution is enumerated. So there are some you know, pretty nice properties of this. Uh, we won't you know, show it explicitly, but it turns out that because I'm permuting a p-value, I end up inheriting the large sample properties of the test whose p-value I am enumerating. So these are, have the same power under local alternative, this large sample test versus the pre-pivoted test, because I'm permuting the p-value of the large sample test. So there's no loss in terms of power or anything like that. So, you know, just to give a few more concrete examples here that uh, as examples of uncovering known corrections. So in the univariate case, it is well known that studentizing a test statistic uh, actually recovers, uh, actually can restore asymptotic validity under the weak null hypothesis. It was a, you know, a paper by Lowe, Richardson, and Robbins that actually kind of talked about that, a paper in a, a statistical science talking about this in the finite population model. And so what we see is that Gaussian pre-pivoting here uh, actually provides a, you know, a monotone increasing transformation of the studentized test statistic. So Gaussian pre-pivoting provides inference that is equivalent, exactly equivalent to the inference provided by studentization. Um, so while you know success of studentization was known in the literature, this form of test statistic that I'm considering captures many, many other test statistics used for inference for the weak null, where studentization alone would not provide a resolution. So say, for example, the max absolute T statistic, studentization works when I've got one dimensional outcome, but if I look at the max of those studentized test statistics, it no longer works. The reason being that the correlation matrix governing the true distribution no longer aligns with the correlation matrix governing the reference distribution. But pre-pivoting ends up fixing that issue, restoring asymptotic validity. So it works when studentization alone would be inadequate to establish sharp dominance. So just to, to wrap up some of the takeaways from the talk that this Gaussian pre-pivoting, pre-pivoting kind of provides a general recipe for restoring asymptotic validity to randomization tests under the weak null hypothesis. As I mentioned, these pre-pivoted randomization tests have the same limiting power under local alternatives as the tests whose p-values they permute. So there's not gonna be a loss in power from using a, you know, a pre-pivoted randomization test. So a pre-pivoted permutation test relative to a large sample test. Of course, there's a downside in additional computation time, but in terms of statistical performance, nothing's lost. So it's hard to you know, kind of imagine beyond computation time, a reason for using the large sample test. I can kind of give you exactness under the sharp null for free if you just use the Gaussian pre-pivoted permutation test. Um, so yeah, uh, it, sorry, this general structure outlined here extends beyond completely randomized designs. So it extends to paired designs, finely stratified designs, and importantly, to re-randomized designs. 
where up until this paper, it was unknown how to actually provide exact and asymptotically robust randomization tests in uh, these re-randomized designs. But Gaussian pre-pivoting kind of, it immediately falls from the theory in this paper, how to come up with that resolution. And this also naturally extends to designs with more than two treatment arms. So if you're curious, there are details of that in the paper as well. So great, uh, thank you all very much for your attention and I'd welcome any questions that people have. All right, thank you so much, Colin, for this great talk. Any questions? <clears throat> Okay. Well, people might be composing questions. I, I like I, I have one question. It's really a sure. great, very smart idea. And I'm just curious that it seems that this framework is very general for a lot of scenarios. So is there any particular like a popular test that is that you cannot do this trick that you should avoid doing that? Like is there any pop, like a very popular example? I'm just thinking about that. Yeah, where this won't work. I mean, I would say, yes. I mean, I mainly focus on things with Gaussian limits. I mean, I guess if you had something on or, or that at least is the push forward of something with a Gaussian limit. So I would wonder if you can find uh, some things where you don't have a Gaussian limit. I will say that in particular in the finite population model, you do run into issues when you want directional inference. So I decided to have, you know, quasi-convex mirror symmetric. Um, and that's because I need to appeal to a result known as Anderson's theorem. There's like a finite, like a fundamental limitation in the finite population model on variance estimation. I can only have conservative variance estimators. And so I need a result that translates conservative covariance estimators to conservative tail probabilities. And that you know, doesn't generally hold for Gaussians. Anderson's theorem tells you that you know, if I've got a quasi-convex function, that will, that will happen. But if I think about in the multivariate case, directional inference using something like you know, a, a max statistic or like a, something that has a chi bar squared limiting distribution, it's unclear if it holds for all alpha. Um, so that's, that's an open question. Okay, thanks. And I see yeah. Thomas raised the hand. So Thomas? Yes. Yeah, so this is a slightly vague question, uh, but very nice talk. Um, so so in the finite population context, so this, this is an unfair question that I'm asking about other work, but so there's been this interest in the Graham Schmidt walk as a method of um, adjustment. And I just wondered if you have any comments on that. Uh, uh, um, yeah, so not directly connected. I'm just curious <laughs> to get your thoughts. <laughs> Right. So are, are there, I mean, I, my understanding was are, there are still issues with just coming up with variance estimators in general with that design. It's not a design I'm super familiar with, if I'm honest. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. That, that, yeah. yes, that's, that's, uh, yes, I think that's, that's an accurate summary. So yes, that was my. Okay. My yeah. So, so, so I mean, I, I'd be curious, like, I, I mean, I, I would be curious if like that Graham Schmidt Watt kind of design still has this property that like under the weak null you get I don't know, if you could derive a more conservative covariance estimator. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that uh, there are extensions to this work thinking about other, you know, resampling schema to do pre-pivoting, like Gaussian pre-pivoting requires access to the variance estimator, but you can get around that if you pre-pivot with a p-value not based upon a, a large sample approximation like a Gaussian, but rather say by the bootstrap, for example. So I don't know, I, I, I guess I just like, yeah, I, I wonder if there's a way to generate this conservative covariance estimator. If you had it, I think this would work out. Uh, 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 one other question that I was gonna add, which was, yeah. so the Arano estimator that, uh, that you know, um, so uh, in, the, in the discussion, we, we sort of ended up um, yes. uh, uh, proposing for the simple setting that we were, we were considering. Yes. Um, uh, you know, I, I've seen that in practice, there's this issue that um, you know. There's this that there's this window where the finite uh, population, where the randomization test sort of has its advantage because you've got a small sample size. But then, but then there's also this problem that then there's uncertainty in estimating the variance as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so that there, so essentially, um, th there were situations where you would think that the that there, there were situations where sort of you, you're expecting that the the uh, more conservative est uh, sorry a, a sharper estimate of the variance of the of the the, the test statistic that you're then going to do the studentization with is going to give you better performance but if the if it's the case that, that there's additional uncertainty being introduced in the variance estimate that in finite samples it doesn't always end up being uh, uh, leading to an improvement. So I, 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 don't right. know, I, I don't know if you have 
have anything to say on it. No, I mean, I, I guess the results for, yeah, mainly, mainly asymptotic here where that would go away. But yeah, no, I, I, I know exactly what I've played around with the error no estimator quite a bit and have, have seen similar things arise. So my sense is that in that case, like, you know, you could use the error no estimator or if you had access to covariates, there are some covariate adjusted estimators. I, I can imagine maybe, you know, the error no estimator, like you say, like in small samples might end up deteriorating performance versus the vanilla covariance estimator. Um, and I think that that would show up in, in the tests I'm proposing as well. Uh, one, one last question actually I was going to ask is that often in practice, people want to, you know, trim or windsorize when they're doing, uh, you know, doing these things. I mean, for various reasons, sometimes because, you know, they're getting crazy values that are, that are noise. So I don't know. I don't know whether you've, whether you've thought about the, uh, uh -huh. about that but. yeah um no i i have a bit i think it would it changes the s demand if you're going to windsorize you can't really be i i don't think you're really doing inference for the sample average treatment effect anymore and if, uh, unless you're you're thinking about when is this for the like treatment effect estimator or is this for the like only in the variance estimator i guess no, what do you, uh yeah no for, for the for the estimate i mean i don't know for yeah. an estimate where you're where you're yeah, yeah. yeah so you're changing the estimate but basically right. just where yeah yeah, but if I yeah, that's what you're changing the S demand, and I think it, it. I think we need to do more work in the finite population model, going beyond the sample average treatment effect to thinking about other relevant right. S demands. Right. Um, I completely agree with that. I'll say in the companion paper, uh, I kind of looked in the in the context of permutation tests in general, and there, you know, it, you, you can do this for all sorts of functionals. You just need sort of an asymptotic linear representation. Um, so I, I'd be curious if something similar arises for like if you can define what the S demand is for the the Windsorized thing. If you can if you if you can get similar results arising. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. All right. Thank you. Thanks. And other questions. So are there no exact finite sample tests for the weak null? Uh, not unless you're going to assume make like distributional assumptions. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Right, Thomas? Actually, actually, can I just chime in there that, that I think for special cases with binary outcomes, I think oh, oh, yeah. by sure, micro sure. yeah. where they, where that's, they, that's right. where they sure. exhaustively enumerate things or yeah. Yeah, I should have known. I wrote a paper doing <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're exactly right. You're exactly right. That with, with binary, uh, you you could actually look at the supremum p value over the composite null that's it yeah that's, that's what thomas is talking about <laughs> exactly great other questions okay if no other question that's thanks colin again for this really wonderful and insightful talk and thank you so much all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming, and, and thanks again for the invite. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, great to meet you. Hopefully, we'll meet each other soon in person. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. Yes. All right. Take care. Thanks. See you.